So uh, welcome to episode 14 of uh, Taker Points. Um, it's also a club hurling final this weekend. Um, and so to coincide with that, we've got two big hurling men on this week. Obviously, our columnist Shane Elliott, we had to get him in because Don Lawyer playing and he'll be able to give us all the inside info. Well, we hope he would, but he probably won't. Uh, all the inside info ahead of Don Lawyer's game with Slot Neil. And also Neil Payden, director of hurling and Antrim is in. And he's going to uh, talk to us about his new role and the future of Antrim, and he'll also give us his thoughts on the Ulster Club Hurling Final as well. But just to start, um, Shane, thanks for coming in. I wanted to ask you about your columnist, column is about this week, um, and I presume you'd talk about the Dunloy Snathnail final, but is that the case? It's probably a split column this week. I've talked about the All Stars, which are a bit topical, uh, and the second half is about the Dunloy Snathnail match, the second half of the column. And, I've also had a bit of a rant, if I'm being honest, about the dropping of the Joe McDonough Champion 15 or the Joe McDonough All-Stars by the, by the association, which just makes no sense to me. So I have a bit of a rant for the first half. Having said that, I think the All-Star selections this year, I think they got right. I couldn't have argued with the first 15. Uh, and I think the hurlers of the year, they got right as well. So they did get something right, but certainly... What they didn't get right was dropping the Joe McDonough All Stars. So your issue this with this year was they they removed all uh, all the All Stars that would be would go go to those who are playing in the Joe McDonough Cup and they've sort of shuffled them into what would be the Liam McCarthy winners and which means counties like Antrim get cut out. Absolutely. Even the way they did it, they released a statement and there was like a two line footnote to that statement saying that the Joe McDonough All Stars weren't going to be happening this year, but that the players would be given consideration in the Liam McCarthy Awards now. We all know that the Liam McCarthy Awards are based on the, the, the top tier teams. I think, I suppose they tried to cover themselves and at least got a couple of nominees, but then the likes of Antrim, Westmeath, Kerry and the other McDonough teams just didn't get a look in, you know, so their players didn't get any sort of individual recognition that all the other tiers got. They did it for the Maher, the Rackard and the Ring competition, but they lumped them all in together and, and made a champion 15 from that. But the fact that the, the McDonough at a time, and I suppose their timing couldn't be worse, at a time when they've just made a decision about two tiers in football, and we all know that the football counties were fearful of, well, profile, recognition, uh, coverage, etc., etc., that they do that to the second tier of the hurling competition, it certainly doesn't, it wouldn't allay the fears of those counties who feel that they're going to become second class in terms of how they're, how they're viewed. What do you think the reasoning for is? Why would they do that? What I can't, for the life of me, understand is how someone sits in a committee room, two or three people or whatever forms a committee now, uh, and, and decides that it would be a good idea to do that. And not only a good idea to do it, but to do it in the way that they did do it. And I'd be interested where Antrim consulted in that, were any of the other counties that are involved in McDonough consulted in that? Was there any communication to say, look, we're thinking of doing this, what do you think? Because I'm sure those counties will all have a plenty to say in terms of, well, hold on a wee minute, have you thought about this? before jumping into it. So I think it was the decision, not only how the decision was communicated, but how they even made the decision that just it defies logic to me. So what do you think the effect is going to be? Do you think it's going to annoy the the county players? Or? I think it would annoy them. I think, you know, people say, oh, individual awards don't. Individual awards do matter. Let's be honest, then they wouldn't have the All-Stars if they didn't matter. So of course they matter. And of course players like individual recognition. I know it's a team game, but all players like to be recognised for what they do. They like a degree of profile that goes with what they do. So to rob the, the, the second tier of, of, of our hurling competitions of, of that recognition. And I should add that it's probably the only competition in the GAA that they don't get any recognition in terms of individual. You know, the, the lower tiers get it, the camogie gets it, the football gets it, the Liam McCarthy gets it, but for whatever reason they've decided that the Joe McDonough shouldn't. So why they made the decision, I've no idea. Um, I think whoever made it should be accountable for why they made it and it should be communicated to the counties affected by it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The frustrating thing is those group of teams that play in the Joe McDonough are the teams that would be making the step up, but we want to make the step up to the Liam McCarthy level, but they're the ones that we've forgotten. Well, we want to make it an attractive competition. We want to give it the recognition that it deserves, because as Neil will absolutely talk about later when he's on who managed the county, the level of commitment coming from the middle tier counties won't be a million miles away from what the top tier counties are doing. 
Um, so to, to, to remove their access to individual recognition just doesn't, it just doesn't strike as being fair to me. And if we're trying to raise the profile of those competitions and to make them attractive to both players and management, they need to be given the same profile there. They need to be given the same opportunities as the other tiers. That's my point. Okay. Thanks very much. We've got Neil Peden here, the director of Hurling from Antrim, and he's kindly in, agreed to come in to talk about uh, Hurling this week, uh, of all weeks, the Ulster Club Hurling final. But I wanted to start, Neil, by asking about this new role, the Antrim director of Hurling role. You were Antrim manager last year, and now you've moved up. Would you call it moved up to this new role? And what, what, what's, what does the role entail? What do you hope it entails? Well, I think, you know, I've been involved with the Antrim Hurling team now three and a half years. So, you know, I was joint manager for a number of years. And then last year, you know, with, with the way it worked out, I, I decided to take on the management role. You know, and it's funny, somebody asked me at a match that a good friend of mine was standing at a match and asked me, well, Neil, what is your role now as director of Hurling? Is it, have they just shoved you out because maybe they want to get rid of you? And, you know, sometimes maybe it feels like that. But, you no, know, a couple of months ago, we, we sat down and had a discussion and, uh, we were looking at you know, what needs to happen with Antrim, with the county board, and, and, and how do we move things forward. Last year, a really good thing happened in Antrim, and that we got a hold of Dan Gleeson uh, from Tipperary, the, the ex goalkeeper. So when the county board spoke to me, they'd been muting this director of Hurling about controlling Hurling within Antrim and sort of looking in the direction of where it's going. And they said to me, how did I feel about it? And, and then I sort of felt, well, this looks like a good time. If Dan's going to come in as manager, we're not having to go out and look for somebody with somebody who has went through our procedures, been there with us. Because generally you're out looking at managers who can come in and are they up to scratch for to come in and do the job. But we have uh, been nurturing Dan for the last year and a half, so we were really happy that when he said yes, and then they said to me, would I take on the directive for And I thought, well, th this is maybe a good time to do it. So what does it entail? And that is a good question. But I see the director of Hurling trying to direct that top level of performance excellence in the pyramid, they call the performance pyramid. I see my level, getting there as a director, of trying to direct that in a proper and meaningful way. I think there's a lot of lack of links between our 17s, our under 20s, and our seniors. And I see them as three county teams. We talk about development from 13 to 17. But when we get to 17, the new minor, that's the first sort of time we pull the, the young fellas pull the saffron jersey on. And that's a time where our development from 13 to 16 has been development squads, and they're working really well with that. Now, again, as a role, I also would like to get involved with that, but who's looking after those teams? Because I think it's, it's not just getting a player pathway linked, we need a coaching link as well. Because it's about the coaches and the team leaders that come in to take the young people that I'm looking really to look at as well. What sort of time frame do you think would be a reasonable one to get that? It's going to take a while, but Gail Fast as well established now, they're in a year now, and they look after our development squads. So they're trying to incorporate a, uh, if you want to call them, procedures in place to how we get these coaches in place. So they, we've got to get people trained up at the right level of coaching. A lot of our coaches might come in from clubs and they're great coaches, but they maybe are not seeing the bigger picture of, I need to go and get my level two. I need to get out and sort of experience different coaches and see what they're doing and get feedback from maybe our county level and senior under 20 down. This is what we would be looking for from players. This is what we need you to do. But it's not just about skill levels. You know, we've got to look at development of, 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 the, of the body. We've got to look at the physicalities of our young players. How are we developing them? How are we educating them in diet and lifestyle? How are we educating them in the things that a, a, a hurler needs to be following on a pathway to become that senior hurler? Because we tend to get our players at senior level and they're maybe just 20, 21 and the expectation of them is huge, but they're not maybe just ready. And so they come in, and there's a lot of good, like for instance, Dunloy, Cushendall, or our own, my own club, Navon, and, and, and Alkeel are in the county semi-finals you know, this year and last year. You know, they have development plans in place for the young people to get them stronger and build them up and look at the nutrition and, and bring that professionalism to them, performance analysis. And they, but they do it in a small way. We've got to increase that in the county level and get our young people in, that when maybe they come to 20, 21, they're ready, to, they're ready for senior where maybe we're getting highly skilled players who just haven't, aren't just ready. And that's what I see is the gap we need to develop. 
one of our columnists, Joe Brawley, you probably know him, he rails against the performance, you, you know, this development squad idea and the idea that it's taking the fun out of the game. Well, how do you respond to that sort of criticism of development squads? The word high performance, the word strength and condition, sometimes people get frightened when are you going to start this for young people at an early age. You know, that's not lifting weights and things like that. It's about an educational program. It's bringing our young people in and getting them in to educationally learn what it's like. What do you need to be doing over that five, six year because uh, there's a gap at 18, 19 when we lose players and we've got to keep them involved as well so we have to look at that aspect of it but enjoyment's key the experience that's what I mean by the coaches they've got to give the experience and it has to be the fun experience but there has to be a learning environment they've got to be improving the, the better, better, better there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a pyramid for that as well but we need better uh, performances at team but we need better skill levels developed we need better uh, the physical developed so there's lots of aspects we need to develop but we've got to make them enjoyable and we're not saying training's all enjoyable it can't be it's hard work sometimes but that's what we have to try to do what do you think the reasons are for losing players? Like, do you have you identified why you're losing players at that age age range? Well, again, there's lots of reasons why people might opt out. You know, maybe opportunities don't come their way. You know, maturation is the thing. Do they develop physically? There's some young people who are very, very physically and very mentally ready to play 16 and 17, and they're really they're like young men. But there's young ones who aren't, you know, maybe they don't get opportunities and then they fizzle out. Where if we can keep them involved till they become in that, you know, when they develop in their own way, because they'll not develop later on in life and don't maybe are just as good at, you, at that young, young age. So we've got to stop and we've got to make it interesting for them. We've got to connect with the young people and make it that, you know, we want you to play for Antrim. So this, we've got to make it, when they look at that vision, Antrim, it's a good place to be. That's where we want them to be. So we've got to make it. You know, we've got to make some form, you want to call it academy, I don't know if that's the right name, we've got to make some sort of schooling system where they come in and we're always working with them over 18, over 19. And that's difficult the way they're changing the age groups as well. Just before we move on, do you have any goals then for this year? Is there a short term goal for the 2020 season or, or, or do you stay away from that sort of thing? Well, I wouldn't want to say short term goal. To me, it's about relationships at the moment. It's about forming relationships. We've got to form relationships. I'm a great believer. I mean, I'm, I'm a school teacher for 35 years. I believe we've got to make connections with schools. I think the GA, especially in Antrim, has not connected. The Gilfast is doing a great job now connecting with the primary sector and they're moving into the post primary. We've got to connect, especially at that performance stage where we talk about under 17, where they're coming into lower six area within a school environment i think there's a lot we can do about developing them educationally and physically within the school environment without having to come into a coaching uh, where you take the all the group away to do different things i think we can rebuild if we can connect with schools and i think we have school hubs we need to connect to because i think if you really look at where our hurlers come from they come from a, a certain number of schools which isn't a great amount and i think we need to develop good relationships with them we need to good, good relationships with our clubs as well we need to develop that as well so from short-term goals that's what I see is building those relationships for me and f letting them talk to people about what their vision is and how we can bring things forward and if I can connect a few wee things off people and bring it together that, that's what I ultimately would like to do not that everything may not work but I, I do see we need to connect and enter more we do need a pathway for our players to see where they are going and I feel it's vital that we do that because there's certain clubs like Dunloy like as I say Cushendall who are a wee step ahead in certain regards, they really are, and they've set up tremendous within their club. You can see why the lawyer and the Ulster final this year. You know, you can see that why you only have to go down to their club to see the connectivity within the community, the connectivity within their own club, how they're linked to their school and how they're linked to their parish. You know, in the city, that's a much more difficult thing to do, but it's something we have to do. You know, we have to try to do. Thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you. Shane, I wanted to get you back in here now so we can talk about the Joe McDonough and the Ulster final. But first, I want you maybe had a listen there to what Neil was saying about the plan going forward for directing of hurling. Does that make sense to you? Is that does that make sense to you about, about what Antrim needs and what how it would help them? I have to say it made total sense. I thought Neil spoke a lot of sense. Uh, and I'm not saying that because he's sitting beside me. I thought there was an awful lot in what he was saying just is absolutely how we should be shaping things. And I think Antrim do deserve credit for taking the move. You know, when I heard of Neil's appointment, I thought, Director Harden, what's, you know, what's that role actually going to entail? What's he going to do? How does, how does it fit in with the Darren Gleeson role as a senior manager? 
but a lot of what Neil is, is, is saying is absolutely right, that that age from 17, and I think the, the one issue I think we're guilty of in the GAA is making judgments on our young players at far, far too young an age. I've been guilty of it myself, being involved with underage team, where you look at a 13 year, 14 year old and you're in your head thinking, ah, he's never going to make it. You know, whereas maturation, when he gets to 17 or 18, that 17 or 18 year old could be better than your very talented 14 year old was at the same, at the same level. So we're too quick to make judgments. And I think the connections with the schools, absolutely. And Neil did pick up on it at the end. I also think there's an absolute need for a stronger connection with our clubs because there is a bit of a disconnect there at times. I was involved with our underage teams for a lot of years and fellas were going to county development squads, but there was no communication coming back from the coaches that were involved with those squads to the clubs to have the conversations about the type of stuff that they're doing, how they're trying to shape them, just to see does that, does that, does that fit with what we're trying to do at club level. So I think we need to be communicating what we're doing at club level, and I take my own club as an example and looking at the structures and everything that we're in place, and be assured that if we're sending players to development squads, that it, 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 we're all working in the same direction. And uh, I certainly get confidence from Neil that that's the type of thing that's going to be looked at going forward. So that can only be a good thing. Yeah, but it's easy to say it now. It's very hard to make that happen, isn't it? It's, it's absolutely. It's walking the walk as well as talking the talk. Um, but I think it's only the start. And I, I, I think I did make a reference in, in my col column to, to Neil's uh, position that we, we need to be careful not to be too quick to judge I think that role that Neil has taken on is, is, is a role that's going to develop over the years and evolve over the years and it could five to ten years before, you know, a combination of what's going on in Galefast, a combination of Neil's role in making that connection, a combination of developing the links with the schools and the clubs, it takes years, it's hard work. So. We, we, we need to be careful not to make judgments, ah, oh, this isn't working and then change direction. I think the Adam have got a direction of travel now and they need to stick with it over a period of time to see whether it'll be successful or not. Neil, at the start of the show, Shane talked about Joe McDonough, the, the awards and the removal of the awards. I know you weren't happy with that either. Are you equally or more angry than he is about the, about the decision? Well, I'm sure the player, players are a wee bit astounded by this because, as Shane said, it happened so abruptly, you know, and then it came about. And, you know, it, it, and I think I always think those awards were valued because I remember over a number of years, I know we nominated the, 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 the numbers we would send to the Christie Ring if you got to the final or whatever, but I mean, it was recognition for those players throughout the year. And, we, you know, we didn't pick them lightly, we picked the best that we felt really represented us well, and we put them forward, and I think that they, they really enjoyed that accolade that they got at that time. So, no, I would agree with you, and I think you know, the powers that be need to look at that and say, you know, have we made a mistake here? And really look at, you know, is it we need to recognise all these competitions? Because on the back of the football, like, they, they stand up and say, they've set a two-tier football, and, yet the, 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 and it's all about recognition, it's all about publicity, and then they do that and just take it away from the, the Joe McDonough. And it, I mean, it, it just, it, 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 the footballers who are you know, saying they don't want to go down this two distances, and that just fuels them, the, 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 the nomination to say, yeah, you're here, go, here, you just go again. You just might speak about doing it, but really, you, in the hurling, you just cut them off. Are you just going to do it in the football as well? So it's, uh, I think they put themselves in a, a difficult position there with that. Do you think it helps Antrim players to get these awards? And, you know, how much would it help them to get these awards and have those awards? Again, she alluded to it earlier, we, we work as hard as anybody, you know, and the, anybody in the two-tier, what you call it two-tier, we work as hard as anybody in there. We put the time and the effort in. So when, when your year doesn't pan out the way you want, you maybe don't make the final, you know, it's, there is the recognition at the end is is nice for the players. All the other players like to see their, they nearly know who you'd be nominating and putting in there for because they know who their best players were that year and it's great that they get, you know, the, they get the award and they get the rec recognition that's there. So to take it away, I think, is hard on players. I think it's very, very harsh and I think they really do need to look at that again because I would be in favour of all tiers getting their All-Star 15 select. I would be much and I would be in favour of that. All Stars is very much the talking point in the Gaelic Life Office at the moment because we're working on all our All Star nominations for all four codes. Um, and it's a constant d debate in the office, and uh, we do so many phone calls and going out. But right now, we're watching the uh, Ulster Hurlan um, and the Ulster Hurlan finals this weekend, the big, big weekend. It's a massive competition and getting bigger every year. Um, what did you think of the finalists this year? You know, in, in the course of three codes, you've got Nuri and Corian playing juniors at St. Enda's um, and Dunga Owen Rua in, in the intermediate and Dunloy 
and Sonny on the in the final in the senior. Look, what do you think of those finalists? Does that surprise you that those names come up? I, mean, I don't think there's anybody come out to surprise there. You know, I felt Gertner Mona are a good outfit. Thought they might have squeezed through, you know, and, and got through, but. Uh, uh, certainly, Sinenda's an owner. I, I watched the owner who played them in the a league game, and I think Sinenda's beat them in both occasions. You know, but I think that'll be a tight uh, enough affair. You know, because it's new territory when you get the finals. You know, and, and for Sinenda's, it's a new it's a new place for them to be. The senior finals. You, you know, I, I'm not shocked. You know, I, I, I think the Loy. Would it, to me would have been favourites maybe to come out this year. It's always you know maybe done like a uh, cushion doll again where, where, where was a tough battle and it always will be. But I looked at injuries around and I looked how Dunloy were progressing. Maybe uh, cushion doll just weren't in the place. Maybe they they, they they would have liked to have been and, and Dunloy pipped them. But certainly uh, I think for me Slack Neil getting to the final. They've been there what that's five finals out of seven years. You know they're the they're they're well recognised now as a strong outfit. You know out of the football that wee bit earlier than they've liked is probably helped them too that they've a focus now on the hurling but uh, if you ask me to put my hand up and say who would win you know I, I think Dunloy have a scoring power that maybe that they don't have Slucknead don't have but if Slucknead get them in the grips I call it the football grip because they've let them play the football and they have that tackling capacity and they have that that that, that physicality then Dunloy will be in for a hard match but if the if the ball gets loose and the ball gets moving and and Deloy get their, their their game flow flowing, I I think they'll be hard to beat because Deloy's defence was excellent in the semi final and I always thought their defence certainly wasn't as strong as their forwards. But I thought Young Smith and McGarry had tremendous games in the semi final and of their strength in the back line now because their forwards are are hard to handle. Shane, what's your thoughts? How are you feeling this week in the build up to this final? Obviously, I'm, I I might have a bit of a bias. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I think Neil's right. Uh, it's a hard one to call, and I'm not sitting in defence just because I'm a Dunloy man. I do think it's a 50-50 game. I genuinely think it's a 50-50 game. I think both teams come with their own strength. I was involved with Dunloy two years ago when Slack Neil beat us in the semi-final, and they taught us a bit of a lesson, actually, uh, in the physicality side of the game. Uh, and we felt it would be a case of, well, we'll open up and we'll play our hurling and our hurling will win at the end of the day. But hurling doesn't always win. And I think they are very good using their body in the tackle. That's hard to work with when you're not as used to it. You know, we come out of Antrim and Neil will know very well that that's not really the way we play. And that football mentality in terms of how tightly they mark and how they mark and how they use their body in the tackle is sometimes when you face it, you think, wow, what's this all about? when we're used to coming through Antrim where you do get playing hurling a wee bit more. And that's not been disrespectful to Slack Neil because they can play hurling too. And they have some extremely good forwards. You know, they have forwards that can pick off scores, particularly from that middle third. You know, and, and two years ago, they sort of picked off long range scores, which were very impressively. And so they're, they're, they're a threat going forward. They're hard to break down. Um, I think the pitch conditions will dictate how the game plays out. And I hope the forecast is such that this week that they can get it, they can get it back into some shape. But this is an ongoing issue with hurling. Like any hurling man from it will tell you, it's not the right time to be playing hurling. And and also, so can we blame the pitch, or is it just the fixture setters? Do we need to move it forward, or is that even possible? I suppose fixture congestion. That's a whole other debate about when when would you play it? When do you get the chance to play it? I'm not a fan of winter hurling. I've said that a couple of times in the column. I I don't like the fact that we play. Hurling's not a winter game. I think it needs a firm sod, needs the ball flying around, needs the air to be a wee bit warmer for you to get the best out of the game. And when you get to the winter months, it, 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 uh, I just think it, it can disrupt the flow. It doesn't make it as attractive as a game. But it is what it is. I think we have to get on with it. It's not going to change. The, the, the major element of the club season tends to be autumn, winter. And the county season seems to be spring, summer now, and that's just the way it is. And I can understand with the fixtures that well, how do you how do you keep everybody happy? So I think it's here to stay, Winter Hurling, whether we like it or not. Even the fact that they've moved the All Ireland competition into January, as I say, Hurling shouldn't be played in January, let alone the, the the Premier Club competition. And we're still waiting on the GEA coming forward with this magic fixture. Uh, conundrum solved with solutions coming forward but I'm, I'm not really seeing it coming anytime soon so we'll just have to get on with it look it's the same for Slack Neil they have to play in the conditions that Deloy have to play in and uh, I just hope that the pitch does the game justice that's what worries me where do you think these two teams are in terms of their um, progression you know because Slack Neil you say have been there a number of times and this Deloy team a younger team coming through would that be fair to say 
it's like they would probably contend with that they have a, a bit of a mix too. You know, they're not an old team either. You know, they have a lot of young players. Uh, uh, and any team will have a mix of your, your younger players uh, alongside your older players. I think it's fair to say we are an emerging team. Uh, two years ago, we just weren't. And it, it goes back, I listened to what Neil said earlier. We, our, our young fellas weren't physically mature enough. They're two years on from that. So I think we're in a better position than we were two years ago in terms of how we've developed. Whereas Slacknail are developed, you know, they're not, they have players that have experience, have been there for the last five, six years, playing at that top level, competing very well at that top level. But I think we're close to being at that level now. So it'll be interesting, Sunday will tell the tale as to whether we have made the improvements that we think we had in those two years. So that'll be the test for Gregory and the boys. What le lessons can you give, to, or advice can you give to people preparing for that Ulster final? Because you've been there before. How do you avoid, do you have to avoid the, the hype or what do you do? Yeah, you avoid the hype by, yeah, you know, and, and Greg has been very good. The boy, you know, there was, there's probably more hype around Antrim for the, for the Antrim final, if I'm being honest. The Volunteer Cup is really the one that we all want. Mm -hmm. And then you get into bonus territory and that, that's not to play down. The Ulster is very, very important, but it wouldn't have, the same, it wouldn't have nearly the same hype around the village as the Antrim final. I think when you win Antrim, it's like a, everybody lets a sigh out and we've achieved something. And then that really focuses minds for Ulster. So I think we can go into Ulster a wee bit more laid back for want of a better way of putting it without, you know, we'll obviously be focused. But uh, I think the pressure's off the boys a wee bit and that they've achieved Antrim. So uh, I, I hope that they go out and enjoy themselves. But Gregory keeps it fairly low profile anyway, so they'll not get too carried away. The likes of Slaney and Dungana would play in Antrim coming through the ranks. Like, how important is that, you know, those underage competitions for them? I don't want to that are playing in Division 2, one of our league here, or Division 2, sorry. So that's really brought them on tremendously. There's no question about that, you know. So they're going to, yeah, they're not going to be frightened of St. Endis. They're going to go out with a respect, but I would say they probably, you know, really look at it and say, well, this is one we could really win here because they, they, they both teams know each other well, and vice versa, and vice versa. But as Shane says, I think, I, th I think it's a very exciting final because two years ago, Slack Neil, this young Dunloy team came to the Ulster final, but they're a different team this year. They're, they're, a, they're a more mature team and they're, they've got a bounce about them, which I really like. And don't be wrong, Slack Neil will come thinking they can take them because they've took them before. And there's no, that's why it's really, I think it's a really exciting final. And there's going to be a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of tactical sort of things going on, which will be interesting to see what happens with sweeper rolls and things like that. And the pitch is going to play an account as well. So, so uh, you know, Dunloy are the up and coming team. There's no question about that. They are the up and coming team and within Antrim you know and it's, they've set a stall, their stall out now and we're all going to have to match it and, you know and I'm sure Cushion Dollar's saying the same Lucky Eel ourselves and Yvonne, you know and, and all the teams are saying Look, let's we've got to get at Deloy because the, 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 the uh, you know the, the final in Antrim is an exit it's one we all want and every team wants to win but but Ulster is too and it's lovely to go on and win Ulster as well and get recognised in the club level because to win an All-Ireland club like Lucky Eel have I'm sure Deloy were beating many a final and they, what a team they had and they deserved to win one but you don't get what you deserve sometimes, unfortunately, you know, and, and, and Dunloy had done so well in that regard, and Cushion Dollam had beaten the final. So club hurling in Antrim is very strong uh, in that sense, and, and that when they get through Austria, the aspiration is, can I get to the All-Ireland final? And then on the day, it's, you, know, you, you can do something on the day, you know. So just before we go, I'm not asking you how to pick it, because that would be unfair, but if you were going to call, Neil, would you, how do you see it going? Is it a couple of points in Dunloy? Will it be close? Or does it... You know. I see it been a very tight physical game. I think Slockney will play that style of hurling. They will they'll, they'll maybe play a sweeper system, you know. I, I liked Slockney the last time. They play a very they play a very they look for the opens all the time. They move the ball about, you know. But I think Deloy might have too much for them this year. I think they've they've got they've got a physicality which they hadn't two years ago. I think they've got young players, but they've learnt over the two years how to handle this. A lot of them have played for Antrim over the last number of years as well, so they've they've got a great experience behind them as well. So you, and then of course when you've you, the likes of Paul Shields on your team, you know, a maestro in his own way, you know, who dictates the pace and, and runs down the line. I don't mean runs them as the way he plays. He just is a leader. You can just see it the way he goes about the pitch and how the young lads looked him. And, you know, when you when you're looking at Nigel Elliott up front or Keelan and these boys, you know, they're 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 gonna and Kobe there. You know, I love it's exciting when they get the ball, there's an excitement. But Slockneil will pull the excitement out of them. That's what they will want to do. They will want to suck that excitement out and hit them hard and let them know they're in a game very early on. And I, that's the way I'd develop them. But I think Dunloy later should come out the winners with the scoring power they have. I really do. You know, Cormac Doherty for Slockneil seems to be their outlet for scores an awful lot. I think Dunloy have a more of a spread. 
And that's just my calling. But again, I think it'll be close and wouldn't shock me if Slack Neil won. But I, I, if you ask me to, you know, that's in the fence, I think Deloy should have too much. Okay, Shane, thanks very much. Do you, you want a final word or are you just going to leave think, it at that? I think we'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. <laughs> Neil, thanks very much for coming in. I really appreciate it. And Shane, look forward to reading your piece in Gaelic Life on Thursday. Thank you, Rob.